Hello, this is HRS TV. Welcome. And I'm Jeannie Poole, the editor in chief of the Heart Rhythm O2 Journal. I am really excited to bring to you today our inaugural interview as part of our new initiative called Global Voices. With Global Voices, we will hear from electrophysiologists and other healthcare practitioners who are practicing in developing or underdeveloped countries, as well as from physicians who collaborate with those providers. Today with me is Uma Srivatsa from UC Davis in Sacramento, California, who is our Global Voices section editor, and our guest, Dr. J.P. Shantar, who practices electrophysiology in Bangalore, in India. He is professor of cardiology and heads up their EP unit at Jadiva Institute of Cardiovascular Sciences and Research. Thank you, JP, for joining us today. We're very, very thrilled for you to be here today. Our topic today is going to be rheumatic valvular disease and arrhythmia management. And so at this point, I'm going to turn over this conversation to Uma, who will um, start us going today. Uma? Thank you, Jeannie. And thanks to HRS for this wonderful opportunity, as well as an initiative. Uh, good morning, JP. Uh, I know it's good evening for you. Um, yep. Let us start off. I know that you have a lot of interest in this problem. Um, you know, in the Western world, we frequently talk about the non-valvular atrial fibrillation. As you know, majority of the population is in the Southeast, East, and uh, um, African continents, where there is a high prevalence of rheumatic heart disease. So we thought it would be a great topic for us to discuss. And if you can share with us some epidemiology and also your experiences among the patient population that you encounter. Um, at the outset, I would like to thank HR, HR uh, Heart Rhythm Society O2 and Dr. Jeannie Poole and Uma for inviting me here for this uh, talk. I'm extremely excited, I'm honored. Um, now let me start by with a small story. You know, it all started way back uh, many years ago. One of our cath lab technicians, a young man, maybe in his late uh, 20s, we knew that he had rheumatic heart disease. He was being looked after by my colleague cardiologist. Um, he landed up with a very massive stroke. So he was aphasic and he could not walk for many months. And then he used to come to the hospital. Nevertheless, he couldn't speak and he used to cry. So, you know, it was at that time, it, it so interested me that even though in India, we have so much rheumatic heart disease, it's a part of our training, whether it is in MBBS or MD or even cardiology training that we hear all these murmurs, we, we listen to all these murmurs and we try to understand what is the lesions involved even before doing an echocardiography. And it was a sort of a intellectual uh, sort of phenomenon amongst all of us to identify all the valvular lesions just clinically. But when I looked at it as an electrophysiological point of view, I found that there is very, very little I could go on how to treat such patients whom I would be frequently seeing in my outpatient department. These are patients who would be referred to me with rheumatic valvular atrial fibrillation. So this set me thinking, and I sort of started looking at various guidelines. And you know, I have to bring this to your notice. Um, it is not that I'm pointing fingers, I just look at the latest guidelines from the ESC. On page 439, there are 33 lines on rheumatic, on uh, valvular heart disease. But it doesn't say rheumatic valvular heart disease, it just says valvular heart disease. There is no guideline as to how you have to do rate control in these people. There is no guideline on what to do, uh, how to do cardioversion in these people. There is no guideline on how to do rate control. There is no guideline on how to cardioward these patients, whether pharmacologically or, you know, um, uh, you know, maintain sinus rhythm versus uh, um, uh, maintain rate control. So you see, when you are looking at rheumatic valvular disease, you are looking at a much younger population of patients compared to your non-valvular atrial fibrillation. These patients are in their twenties, thirties, and many a times forties. And as all of you know. When you have rheumatic valvular disease, approximately 30% of these patients have atrial fibrillation. Now I'll give you some epidemiology. As per the statistics, there are 33 million people with rheumatic valvular disease, out of which, you know, at least 275,000 patients die every year. There are 9 million disability 
life years which are lost. So this is a huge problem. And when you look at the guidelines, no doctor gets a guideline. And finally, this is going to be a universal phenomenon. Majority, almost 80% of rheumatic valvular disease is in the Middle East, Africa, Southeast Asia. And uh, when you look at it, there are no guidelines even, even in the Asia Pacific region to how to treat these patients. And uh, we are depending on guidelines for non valvular atrial fibrillation. So rate control doesn't make a difference. In fact, I will have to bring it to your notice. One of my friend, a colleague, Dr. Amit Vora, did a, a very fine study on, on patients with rheumatic valvular uh, atrial fibrillation. He used amiodarone to get them into sinus rhythm and maintain them. They cardioverted to sinus rhythm and maintained them in sinus rhythm with amiodarone. And he found that the patients did much better when they were in sinus rhythm and almost 70, 80% of the patients were in atrial fibrillation, uh, were in sinus rhythm. But nevertheless, you know, it, uh, amiodarone is a very toxic drug. And when you look at it, giving it for a long uh, number of years in a young patient, uh, it is very difficult to main, uh, maintain these patients because most of them, as you know, there's a 35% incidence of toxicity with amiodarone. So we have been looking at it in a different way. We, we have done a study which we published in cardiology of cardioversion with atrial fibrillation, cardioverting pharmacologically these patients with atrial fibrillation. We looked at patients with uh, rheumatic valvular disease who are not surgical candidates who had atrial fibrillation. So we took up 165 patients. We used ibutilide. Ibutilide works wonderfully well in this group of patients. 77% of patients convert to sinus rhythm. And once you, if they don't convert, you can easily cardiovert them. Almost, you can get almost 97 to 98% of these patients unless they have extremely large atria such as 6.57 centimeters, you can almost always get them into sinus rhythm. So this is a wonderful drug, which has not been mentioned in literature. In fact, when I sent my paper manuscript, uh, we had 1.8% incidence of uh, um, a torsad. So we have not now started another study where we are now looking at uh, giving magnesium. So we have randomized this and we are, we, are, we are in the process of, we have recruited about 35 patients. So hopefully we should have some answer of reducing the incidence of, uh, you know, torsa. The other thing which we need to look at is how are we going to maintain these patients in sinus rhythm? So that's another issue that we are looking at. So we had started a trial with uh, calcium channel blocker and flecainide. Unfortunately, after uh, enrolling 35 patients, uh, we could not complete the study because COVID came in and we lost all these patients to follow. up. So we are back to square one and we have restarted it back. Now, having said all this, now these patients, there is a very, very fine thing which is happening. You know, most of the endemic areas are in Southeast Asia, Africa, and Middle East. However, there have been two epidemics of rheumatic fever acute rheumatic fever in the West Northern America, as well as Australia. These have been in very clusters. And this has happened, first epidemic has happened in the mid twenties and the second epidemic apparently is ongoing. But when you take out the literature, not only you, you don't find any mention of this anywhere, either in the guidelines or anywhere, which makes it very difficult for a physician who's going to be faced with it. The other aspect which you have to realize is you now world is a very small place. There's going to be a lot of immigrants coming either from Hispanic countries, or Latin American countries, the Middle East, um, you know, everywhere. So you're going to have not only the problem of patients who have had acute rheumatic fever, because it takes about 15 years for them to manifest rheumatic heart disease. So it's another interesting thing I'll tell you. When it affects, when rheumatic fever affects, it affects equally for both males and females. And if you, if you take these patients with acute rheumatic fever, 60% of them develop rheumatic heart disease, 60%. Now, if you look at the 60%, the females are more affected, at least 1.6 to two times more affected than males. It is said that probably these females do not get proper treatment. Number two, the strain of pregnancy is there, which worsens their, this thing, and they're rather neglected and do not get the, the secondary uh, uh, prevention prophylaxis with uh, benzene penicillin properly. 
The other issue of uh, atrial fibrillation, as you know, in rheumatic heart disease, and I've told you that 30% of rheumatic heart disease have atrial fibrillation, and many of these patients are young, they are unemployed, they are females, and they do not get proper primary and secondary prophylaxis. This is rather sad. So JP, let me interrupt you for there for a second, because you brought up a very nice point about antiarrhythmic therapy long-term, young people. So amiodarone is not a good drug in that age group that we're talking about, and especially when females are going through pregnancies. What are the availability of other antiarrhythmic drugs in India? And has there been any studies for long-term antiarrhythmic management and anticoagulation management? How is it even feasible? Because we have committed clinics here where we monitor patients for INR. How do you guys do that? Okay, now you are touched upon a very important point, which I'll uh, work through. You see, um, these patients, many of them, if you see the Remedy study, Remedy Asia part of the study, in Remedy Asia part of the study, the anti you know, in, in India, almost 30 to 40% of the patients who have atrial fibrillation have rheumatic heart disease, unlike in the West, which is where it is 2.2%. So you have 2.2% in North America where we have about 30 to 40% of our patients with atrial fibrillation with, uh, with rheumatic heart disease. So that's a significant number. Now, in these patients, if you, look at the, uh, if, if you look at the Remedy Asia study, it says that most of the patients are in sub-therapeutic range because most of our physicians don't give therapeutic anticoagulation. In fact, it is time in therapeutic range is only about 30 to 40% compared to 50 to 60%. And if you have to prevent stroke, you have to realize that we have to be seven, about 70% in time in therapeutic range, which is rather sad. So most of the patients do not get proper treatment. That is an issue because it's difficult to get INRs done in many rural areas. So they have to travel back and we try to convince them and make it um, better but nevertheless, if you have to want, if you want to get an INR, they have to travel to a small town or city to get an INR, and then we try to ring them up on the phone and try to say that okay, uh, increase or decrease the dose of medication. So we try to do that. But nevertheless, nowadays there has been an improvement in the past four five years in in the outreach of medical facilities to rural areas. So I think over a course of time it is going to improve. The other thing which I'm going to make another point is in the past 15 years, there has been a 15, five-fold decrease in the number of rheumatic fevers which have come around. So improvement in the socioeconomic status, more urbanization has also brought about some changes and hopefully this will reflect in lesser and lesser, and we are doing less number of PTMCs, percutaneous mitral valve, valvotomies have decreased quite significantly. And this also probably in a way indirectly indicates that there has been a decrease in um, uh, rheumatic high, uh, rheumatic fevers. Have I answered your question? And you have, there, is you no, have. There, 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 there are not, see, uh, just let me interrupt you. I, I didn't answer your other question the, uh, about the anti arrhythmics. Yeah. In India now, we did not have uh, flaconide and propofenone uh, uh, before. Now we have, it's freely available. So the, we manufacture it in India and it's available for Indian patients. Unlike quinidine, where India manufactures all the quinidine, but we don't have it in India, it's available only in North, North America. Right. So now, as an electrophysiologist, um, you know, in, in Western non-valvular ablation works better than antiarrhythmic drugs. What are your thoughts about ablation management? And what about appendage closure, rheumatic fever, the stroke risk? occurs not necessarily from the appendage. So is there even a role? Can you please elaborate? Yeah, it's a very fantastic question. It's very important. There are very small studies, um, you know, involving 15, 16, 20, 25 patients where um, AF ablations have been done. Probably some of them, a uh, larger number has been done from China. But having, you know, having said that, uh, you also have to realize that the pathology in, in mitral stenosis is uh, in, my, in rheumatic valvular disease is slightly different because we have published two pathologic papers. In fact, getting these papers into Western mag, um, manuscripts is very difficult, let me tell you. I have sent these papers and the, the reviewer writes, this is not applicable for us, so the paper is rejected. 
And both these papers have appeared in JCE, where we looked at mitral regurgitation and mitral stenosis, where we look at, look at the pathology. You see, what happens is if they are in sinus rhythm, there is myocellular hypertrophy. But the moment they, they go into degeneration, they go into vacuolation. The cellular vacuolation is very prevalent. And there's also inflammation in the appendage, which tells you that there's high degree of thrombosis there. So now we have put in a paper of mixed mitral valve disease. So we have done 77 patients where we have taken out tissues from five parts, both right atrium, left, left atrium, and done 10 different the histopathological, you know, um, uh, studied 10 histopathological changes. And uh, we hope to su submit the last paper uh, shortly. Nevertheless, having said that, rheumatic heart pathology is very scarred. Many areas are scarred. And the moment you start ablating, there are times when you can go on for three, four, five hours, you will never get them into sinus rhythm. They are very badly scarred um, atria, and it's very difficult to maintain sinus rhythm, especially if the atria is more than 5.5 centimeters. And I'm sure Prash Sanders will tell you he has spent hours in Velour trying to get them into sinus rhythm. And I, I think he also exhausted his um, you know, time there. So getting doing atrial, then there's also a high rate of recurrence because there's continuous remodeling going on. You're just adding more and more scars into this. Fibrous tissue is there everywhere throughout right and left atrium. Now you bring the topic of left atrial thrombus. If you see, our, our institute itself has published the classification of thrombus in rheumatic atrial fibrillation. So you can have it only in the appendage. It can, you can have appendage plus the body, where it comes down into the body. You can have thrombus at the roof, above the fossa ovalis. You can have it below the fossa ovalis. You can have it on the fossa ovalis. You can have a ball wall thrombus. So you can have it all over. So I don't think just by closing your appendage, you're going to get away with it. The second thing you have to realize is the left atrial appendage is going to be very huge. Right? So you have to realize that these are huge atria. So it's almost like a small house. So, <laughs> so, so, so you have to get a very big left atrial appendage closures. But there are some certain very good uh, surgeons who are now doing, whenever they do the mitral valve surgery, they do the close of the left atrial appendage and right atrial appendage. And you have to realize in rheumatic valvular disease, you also have thrombus in the right atrial appendage. JP, we're going to have to bring this to a close. I have to say that this was really enlightening for me. I think you nicely characterized um, some of the challenges and gaps. And um, I've always been concerned about the first point that you made, that the guidelines that we have simply cannot be implemented in many other countries. I think that you know this definitely offers us a um, greater insight into rheumatic um, heart disease and the problem of atrial fibrillation. There's a lot of work to be done. So I just wanna really thank you for sharing your insights with us today. I hope we can take um, some of these challenges and actually turn them into actions. Um, and Uma, I want to thank you for your leadership in this initiative, and we really look forward to, you know, further interviews and working with you, JP. Thank you so much for your time today. And thanks, everybody, for listening thank to you. HRS TV. Yeah, thanks, JP, for all the good work. Thank you.